So um, it's now 4 p.m. in the UK and 11 a.m. Eastern time in the US. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Finos virtual meetup this afternoon and this morning. Um, this is actually our, our second um, virtual meetup, the first of which was last week. Um, and I'm very happy to see everybody joining the call this afternoon. Um, our aims, aims at Finos are to hold um, a virtual uh, meetup, um, hopefully um, as often as we can, uh, with vacations and also um, schedules permitting. Um, so far, we've um, been able to do that each Wednesday. Um, and so we'll see how we can um, see whether we can keep that going forward um, moving on. Um, whether we can do that around our own holidays and, you know, around all of the various different breaks that we have across all of our different time zones, etc. Um, but it's brilliant to be able to invite people who are both part of the um, Finos um, community and also people who are new to Finos um, into this call so we can all say hi um, and welcome um, each other. Um, so it gives me um, a great pleasure to actually uh, welcome Tom Shady, um, CTO of GreenKey um, and the, the lead of our, um, our voice um, project um, into the call this afternoon um, for a talk on seven unexpected lessons from two years of our SD, SDK in banks. And so, Tom, welcome to the call this afternoon. Um, if I can hand the call over to you. Great. Uh, thank you, James, and good day, everyone. My name is Tom Shady. I'm the CTO of GreenKey Technologies. We are a fintech startup focusing on NLP for the financial industry. What that means is we can take in unstructured voice and chat data, turn that into structured communication, and from there power men downstream workflows. So in today's talk, you know, the goal for me is, is to help people understand some of the common and uncommon frictions that we've experienced through getting our open source SDK adopted by banks so that you can accelerate usage you know, in your own firms for whatever open source project you'd like to. Um, so first I'm gonna present some background on our SDK, what it does, what, the, what our engine does, just so you can uh, get some context for, for these lessons. I'm gonna get right into seven lessons we've learned some hard won over the last two years uh, and try and present some of the mitigations and solutions that we've done for these uh, again just to so you can avoid some of these problems yourself or accelerate them uh, and then lastly i'm going to mention some resources not only to help contribute to uh, the finos projects and the green key sdk but uh, how to accelerate open source usage in your firm through some of the excellent um, FinOS programs that exist. So without further ado, get right into a description of our engine. So the SDK is a software development kit that sits on top of an API behind which is our NLP engine. And what this does is, is captured uh, most efficiently in this slide here. So we take this unstructured inquiry, and I get a price uh, and the product mention and the price and, and all the uh, various details. And we take that unstructured text and turn it into the below JSON. So this is a, a, a one quick snapshot on what we can do. And then of course, JSON is the lingua franca for uh, interoperation these days. You can power many downstream uh, products and, and uh, reports from this. So what is our green key discovery SDK? It allows you, your firm, to create your own custom rules and definitions to help power this NLP or load the rest. So it, it takes a transcription in, we determine the intent, which you can think of as uh, like a command or a verb. And we search for all the relevant entities in that expression. An entity you can consider loosely like an object or a noun. Our algorithm, uh, which is uh, one of the my favorite parts of, of GreenKey, 
allows you to choose the best set of all these possibilities, or, or the engine automatically does that for you. And then, of course, we populate the JSON, as you saw before. So what's an example of this? This is sometimes called the NLP uh, intent slot filling. As an example, let's say you, you say open Google Chrome. Open the intent. Google Chrome is the entity. But where this gets complex is Google could be an entity or Chrome could be an entity. And so what our engine does is it figures out the best combination. In this case, Google Chrome is, is, is what you meant. Uh, and, and we learn this over time. So what do we do with these results? Uh, this feeds into why we need the SDK. So we generate a lot of reports right now. There's several examples here. We find all mentions of a product in email, voice, and chat. This allows you to miss fewer opportunities. You can create an audit trail. You can analyze a vast amount of uh, content in minutes, and speed customer interaction, and ultimately we want to drive trades. So this is uh, this is the motivation for, for a bank to, to pick up our SDK. And the reason they'd want to do so is there's always some custom extensions. So the, the motivation for us offering an open source SDK for, uh, through FinOS is, you know, we provide a very good base level engine, but for people who want to customize it further, maybe they have very specific things for their firm. We thought allowing them the power of an open source SDK on top, you can really customize it. Uh, and, and tailor it specifically to, to your needs. So, uh, you know, if you're interested in that, there's an email below. Uh, so, James, if you can relax, my sales pitch is over now. Uh, so, what what we do here if for this presentation, I'm going to be talking about uh, our experiences from a startup perspective. But all partnerships are two way. So it's good for both sides to be aware of the problems that you may experience. Uh, this is really comes down to an impedance mismatch. There's a fundamental frequency difference between a startup and, and a bank. Um, you know, there's opposition to certain information that comes in just organizationally. Uh, we operate a certain way, banks operate very differently. Uh, and so lessons, although they'll be from my perspective as a startup, you could easily see, you know, bank for those uh, calling in from uh, banking institutions. Uh, you can see the kind of problems that uh, both sides have. So, without further ado, we get into the first one. Uh, don't assume hub accessibility. So these are going to be pretty specific, um, but I'm going to show through some examples here. So, this is a sample conversation that we would have. The customer. Uh, allow you to read that for a moment. And the lesson here is that don't assume, even if someone says they have access, it may not be full access. This was a big surprise to us when somebody says, Yeah, we can access GitHub. Okay, cool. This all these things. Oh, no, we're, we're restricted in the specifics of how we do that. We can't use SSH, we can't hit certain endpoints. Uh, and so this, this was a big shocker. Uh, you know, most open source people collaborate around GitHub or GitLab or some centralized uh, code repository. And so this had took some doing. Fortunately, its origins began with email-based workflows uh, in the 90s. So, you know, there's a long history of and tooling for, for you to collaborate over email, but this is something that, that we wanted to get up front. How are we going to collaborate? Um, what are the restrictions? You'll see this is a common theme throughout a lot of uh, these, uh, and that's that communication solves a lot of problems. Number two, don't assume familiarity with tools that you take for granted. So our banking customers are not us. It's not a typical open source community. If you're offering open source software to a financial institution, you can't assume some of the things that you might um, for things in you know, the Apache Foundation, for instance. So some tools are pretty well known. Uh, PIP and PM amongst the generally no problems with those. But one thing that really surprised us is people who are not familiar with Docker, we've been using it for years. It's kind of second nature for us. So the Docker command line was, was a challenge. Uh, 
Some of our customers are Microsoft shops. Um, I know there's a Microsoft open source community as well, but we're not familiar with that. You know, we're, we're Linux based. So uh, just the standard Unix command lines uh, tools, it, it was surprising the, the level of um, difference in, in understanding there. And even bash scripts, which you know we we would supply uh, on a regular basis, there was some difficulty there. So uh, we have a lot of Windows users in our, in our clients, even Windows development, uh, and this is just not something to take for granted. Uh, and so asking a lot of questions up front, uh, being very explicit, uh, providing really good readmes are all good solutions for this. Um, the next one. This is something we hoped for, did not find. It's that we shouldn't assume people are gonna to wanna to tinker with your product. What I mean by that is, understand that there's an open source project that's interesting, you can download it, play with it, do some experimentation. It's something we're hoping for, that's not what happened. So, you know, our customers either ignore us, do a quick hello world and then ignore us, or the ones that are successful have a mandate to drive this in a schedule. So that's something we, we address up front. Uh, you know, this is a, a, a mutually beneficial financial uh, partnership. Uh, we don't want to waste our time or our customers' time. So right up front, it's uh, what's the project plan? We have this open source software. Who's going to be working on it? And what's their mandate? Time kills wheels, and it's just important to accelerate things uh, by getting buy-in up front. So this one was uh, is constantly surprising. Assume every possible restriction in a company. Uh, we have some examples. Here, but there's some standard ones where, you know, ports are locked down, protocols, file permissions are very restricted. You know, developer laptops may exist in some kind of limbo between production and something open. Uh, one of the surprising things we had was that admin access time was limited to 20 minutes at one, at one customer. And we use a lot of machine learning libraries, and they take quite a long time to install them, very large. It, it takes more than 20 minutes to install some of these. So our install process was quite long. We had to break our installer up into 20 minutes seconds so this customer could, could install it correctly given their uh, 20 minute window for admin time for root access. So this is something that was pretty surprising. Now, how do you possibly address all of these things that might go wrong? Uh, I medical devices years ago. There's something that uh, just came out of the military. FMEA is a process called failure mode effects analysis. Basically assume that everything is gonna fail. Assume everything will go wrong. Throughout your software, throughout your communication, throughout your stack, how is this gonna go wrong? And what are the consequences of it? Okay, so the install script's gonna fail, how? Okay, the, you know, uh, Every, going through painstaking detail on every single component and how is this going to fail from a communication, from a uh, permission perspective, doing all this upfront will save you a ton of time and grief for our customers. And an, an interesting technique we like to use is uh, reverse brainstorming. It's one of my favorites. That's where you imagine the uh, have the opposite goal and decide how you would achieve that. So how would we make sure if I'm a bank, that we can never deploy software. <laughs> Go through all the possibilities of that. Okay, let's make sure that no one has any call permission. Uh, let's make sure that admin access is five seconds long. Uh, let's have all ports blocked. And then when you reverse that, you sometimes come up with uh, interesting solutions for these. Um, number five, do provide advanced tutorials. This helps with it. This is a good mitigation to help with a couple of the problems that we have elsewhere. We also need it to be extremely explicit. Um, this helps with the familiarities uh, with tools. That's our number two surprise. Um, don't assume people know bash commands. Don't assume people know uh, Docker commands. Don't assume anything. 
type out every single command that was necessary to get your things installed. You'll see this with some larger open source projects to kind of skip some steps uh, because they assume a certain level of knowledge, assume nothing. Um, the one metric we used to use was time to first hello world, that's TTFHW. It's, it's a good metric for an SDK, it's how long does it take someone to get a quick example up and running? Complex, found that wasn't enough. So we had to continue and it's how long does it take someone to go through the advanced tutorial? Hello world, for those not familiar, is uh, a primordial expression for how, what's the simplest possible program and that's one that you just print hello world on your screen. So, and there's a lot that happens for, for that to occur. So what's the simplest possible use of our SDK? Let's get that and let's, let's measure that. But it actually, the advanced, um, the advanced case was, was more important. Uh, a huge benefit of this is by doing a, an extreme advanced tutorial, you actually uncover a lot of restrictions in a firm. So uh, by someone executing this tutorial very early, you know what their access restrictions are, you know what some of the developer laptop uh, restrictions are, it saved a ton of time for us. So. Um, you know, it, it's not quite, you know, build something for your production example, but it's close. Uh, and it allows you to find all the roots early, which saves a ton of time. Here's one that, uh, that surprised me. So this, this has happened that, um, I, I hate to say it, two firms. I didn't learn my lesson the first time, but it's, yeah, we're almost ready to go. Have you met our CISO? Uh, Customers are large organizations. Separate departments feel like separate companies. And it's very difficult to understand how to navigate the full path of your, of your firm. And if you can find someone that knows that, they're worth their weight in gold for you. And so what we've had to do is when we engage one team, we actually reach out proactively say, okay, let's, who's the infrastructure content here? Who's your security officer? What's your security team? If you're doing a cloud-based product, it's what cloud team do you have? So we don't wait for our customers to drive that project. We reach out and do it ahead of time. So you, as a startup, you may need to drive this. Uh, the last thing you wanna do is get everything in place and then do a full stop because some important business unit was not considered. The lesson here is that uh, you know, organizations are, are huge and complex. Uh, you can't always count on them to be, to know how all the check boxes that they're gonna need ahead of time. So just reach out, proactively do this. And the last one, it's sound like a catch-all, but it's, uh, it's good guidance for us. Really don't assume anything. Uh, th this has happened to us too. Great, everything's in place. Can you run it on Red Hat 6? So for those that don't know, it's a 10 year old operating system, which is 40 years old for a startup, it, you know, it's startup years, practically, it's just, it's ancient. And so weird blockers come up at the last minute. How do you handle unknown unknowns? Of course, it's, it's impossible, but you can do your best by really asking questions all the time, hunt down risks, Find miscommunications. What do you mean by that word? Uh, it's it's critical to get to speak the same language, and you probably don't. So ask a lot of questions all the time. Think ahead. What might go wrong? Um, and lastly, expect there to be a surprise. You have to plan for curveballs. You have to leave room in a project plan for unknown unknowns because there will be in every single one. Um, and so, in summary. The list, um, you know, don't assume acts, the tools you take for granted. Don't assume the same knowledge. Don't assume that people are going to be interested in playing with your software. They're they're there for a professional reason only. Uh, you ha you have to assume every possible restriction. A lot of these problems through very advanced step by step tutorials. Get ahead on a communication problem. Lastly, <laughs> plan for curveballs. Uh, they have detected the contradiction in these rules, but you know the world's messy. It doesn't always boil down into seven simple principles. So, um, before we get into any questions, 
just like to remind people that there are many ways to contribute. FinOS is a great organization. We're happy to be a member. Uh, there's many repositories inside FinOS that you can look at on GitHub. There's a repository link. A program that I, I very much enjoy that actually is designed to solve a lot of the problems I brought up today is the Financial Delivery Accelerator, FDX. There's a group called OSR inside it, which is Open Source Readiness. Uh, I believe there was a call there this morning to help your firm with the policies and procedures and thinking required to ingest uh, open source projects. And then I put links to two of our open source offerings inside FinOS. The first one is the Discovery SDK that I mentioned today. Second one is a standalone project to help you with speech recognition. So please take a look at those. Uh, take a look at FinOS. There's a lot of opportunity to contribute here. And uh, thank you for your time. That's amazing, Tom. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so before we actually go into Q&A, um, something that I'd like to say is this afternoon we will be giving away two um, free FinOS t-shirts um, at random to people who have registered in advance for the call. Um, so Grizz in the background is um, currently getting the um, random number generator uh, warmed up to pull those names. Um, and also just to remind people that um, we do have uh the finos page um on linkedin and we also have a twitter account and we've also got github.com forward slash finos um which um grizz has actually put in the chat um if people want to follow those links and find us um so okay so tom i, I guess now uh, you're ready to to move into um a q a so um if anybody's got any questions in fact actually i've got one coming through or there is one in chat from Emerging Tech uh, NY, um, which is, what was the motivation to open source through FinOS instead of other foundations or even maintaining it yourself? So that one is actually quite a, an honest question. So Tom, are you, are you happy to answer that? Yeah, sure. Well, I'm happy to answer anything. Uh, so we do maintain it ourselves inside FinOS, first of all. Um, you know, FinOS is an organization providing a lot of resources for us uh, that we thought was a best fit for this. But, you know, we are actively making pull requests and our team every day is improving the SDK. So, so we certainly maintain it. And, you know, we, we do accept outside contributions as well, uh, subject to FinOS uh, rules, of course. Uh, FinOS was a great organization because there's such a focus on finance and all of our customers and potential customers, uh, many of them are members. Uh, we share the same interest in helping out with all of the frictions and interoperability between this, this whole platform. And we think that FinOS is best poised to, to help everyone. Um, that's amazing. Uh, specifically from financial institutions. Absolutely. Um, and we also have a question from Mohit, um, who asks, how do you suggest to start a core banking software with open source tech stack? Wow. <laughs> um, I, each, each bank is going to be very different, I think. I mean, there's there's a variety of, of open source stacks to, to start with. I mean, that's a tough one to answer. Uh, I think you should choose the right tools for the job. I, I hate to give you that answer, but it depends. Um, so can, can I give an, a different angle to that same question? Um, so Tom, in, in your experience, would you go to the tech stack first, you know, in order to solve your problems with your team, or would you um, go out to the vent to the, to the banks to ask them what level of open source they will accept before you architect your solution? Uh, I see what you're saying. So from, from that angle, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's no point in offering something customers don't want. Uh, you know, we, we obtain, you know, on our engine side, we, uh, we build that with best of breed that uh, that's a closed source solution. So whatever uh, is best for us there, but absolutely. So we interview people, we ask them, uh, we thought about who's going to be using this. You know, at first it was, you know, our first iteration, we thought data scientists would be doing this. 
Uh, and so you know, Python was, was an interface. Then we realized that we could be that data scientist for you. And so just simple config files, um, you know, YAML is all that's necessary to, to drive the Green Key Discovery SDK. So, uh, you know, you, you definitely have to interview people, understand what they can use and what they can't. They're certain they're very popular. Node seems to have caught on. Certainly Python is, is in most places. Um, and Python is, is totally acceptable. Um, now, where it gets trickier, things like Docker, uh, Kubernetes, this is what we deploy on. So when we go on premise, we found some, some obstacles there. Uh, but for a small company, we thought that was worth the risk. It lets us deploy in our cloud with the same stack as an on-prem solution. We, we do, you're, you're right in that we do spend considerable time educating, uh, helping our customers get through that process, sometimes helping them get approval to, to use those tools. So that's a conscious choice we made. You, you just have to ask a lot of questions to your customers and, uh, and tell your solution. That's brilliant. Um, okay, so very hits coming in uh, with another line saying, I guess online banks like Monte are using certain open source tech stacks, um, which is absolutely right. So very hit. I know um, firsthand that um, Monzo um, are. Um, so they actually came into a meetup that I run in London um, and gave a demonstration of GraphQL. Um, but I guess, you know, they've had the uh, opportunity to architect their platform from the, the ground upwards, whereas um, a lot of startups are actually, you know, supplying software into banks where that architecture has been around for quite a while. Um, okay, Tom, so another question for you, if it's okay, and this one's actually from me. Um, so within your, your presentation, you gave some great examples of where you kind of hit blockers um, as you start introducing your software. Um, and more people get introduced into the project team. Um, do you probably at the wrong time as well? So like about to go live and then see, so kind of like get introduced, which um, I've also seen before. Do you have any examples where a bank has kind of changed and maybe you get all of those people um, around the table in advance? Um, or have you had the chance to influence who those people should be in advance of your project or your introduction to that bank starting? I mean, we try, uh, you know, we focus on learning from our mistakes. Uh, each time we interact with the customers, a chance to get better. And so we have checklists, project plans, our success team is measured by how fast they can onboard and get to production. And so we. Uh, you know, we look for those opportunities. Uh, it's hard uh, because we, you know, sometimes an organization is a huge black box to us. And so, you know, we may have a handful of contacts. We just do our best. Um, generally speaking, there's, there's fairly standard patterns that people follow. You know, there's an infrastructure team. You have to get on there their backlog, you have to get them to help deploy it if it's an on-premise solution. Um, yeah, it, it changes every time, so it, it's, there's no cookie cutter solution, unfortunately. So in retrospective, if this was like a, an agile retrospective, you know, kind of session, is there any advice that you would give to the to the bigger banks about how they can be, you know, more inclusive of, you know, startups and fintechs who do have innovative solutions, um, but maybe their current setup, both in terms of org design and in terms of architecture, is limited limiting that engagement. Sure. Yeah, I think whether it's your job or not, it's important to get a fifty thousand foot view of things. I know that. You know, if you're an implementer or tasked with something specific, you know, your nose is to the grindstone, you have a six inch view of things. But uh, someone on the project, and maybe that's you, needs to take a step back and say, okay, wh what is, what are the potential blockers here for this? What can go wrong? Um, I think it's just foresight. You know, this so surprised could have been foreseen. 
know, by our customers. You know, the second time it was definitely, you know, that, that was on us and we can foresee that, but uh, it's important to make sure someone on the project can, can work interdepartmentally and knows about all these connections. You just need that person that understands the, the flow of your politics of, of your approval process. So we, we, as a startup, we really seek that person out. Uh, do you understand how the different departments work together? Okay, no, who, who does? Who can we talk to? Let's get them, uh, let's get them on this call. Let's get them on this project. So. Uh, that's, um, that's brilliant. Um, so I'm actually looking in our chat. We've um, got a bit of a, a conversation starting from Trey, um, who's um, replying to Rohit. Um, it's, it's really good to see everybody engaging. Um, and thank you about the uh, fraud monitoring, monitoring question as well. Um, so if there's um, any questions that people have about Finos, um, or if people want to get in contact with me, you know, after this webinar, feel free to email me at james at finos.org and we can continue the conversation. Um, so, okay, so we're um, at 4.30 uh, in the UK um, and 11.30 Eastern time in the US. Um, does anybody have any additional questions? Um, actually, one's just come in for Trey. So, Trey, you're asking about um, a Finos um, Slack uh, question. So, and Mike, you're, you're replying to that. So, at the moment, uh, Finos doesn't have a Slack channel. Um, but we do have um, a number of working group calls that people can um, join uh, in order to continue um, the conversation around our projects. Um, the reason that we don't have a Slack channel is because we actually uh, communicate using Symphony, uh, which is supplied um, for the regulated banking industry. Um, and that's all part of you know, the, the offering that Finos actually um, has. It's about being able to communicate across a regulated industry without being seen to, you know, influence within that area. And so we have certain kind of um, processes and boundaries that we put in place to make sure that everybody's safe. Um, and so feel free to call out to me if you have any questions like this. So, you know, how can we actually, you know, keep in contact with you? How do we keep communication going? So um, my email address is james at finos.org. So thank you for asking that again. Um, and it's really good to see that there is such a conversation happening in chat here because we are a very communicative um, foundation um, and we also have um, a GitHub organization. So github.com forward slash Finos where there's a lot of conversation that happens around our issues and around our projects and around our teams. Um, so Tom, I don't want to take over your webinar. This is um, your webinar. I don't know if you would like to Say anything as we get close to the end of um, our session. No, this was great. Um, just uh, thank you, James. Just, uh, thanks for the opportunity to present virtually in today's summit. Uh, you know, and for everyone, just to not don't underestimate the differences between partners and over communicate ask a lot of questions learn don't make any assumptions that's that's generally the, the high level uh take away from us. and that's 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 amazing and i'm pretty sure you're always looking for new contributors um into the voice um program as well so if anybody Absolutely. if anybody wants to contribute to finos then um feel free to email me and you know i'll be happy to put you in contact with people Thank you so much, Tom. That was amazing. I really appreciate that. And just to let people know that we will be putting this um, uh, virtual meetup um, on YouTube, and we'll also be publishing the slides on LinkedIn. So with that, I'd like to say thank you to Tom, and thank you for everybody who's joined the call this afternoon.